Yes, thank you, Hani. Thank you very much for the exciting presentation. I can attest that it was not your student giving the talk, but it was you. So thank you very much. Here's how you know it's me, by the way. Um, hands in front of the face are very hard to deep fake still. So I like to do this when I'm on video so everybody is sure it's me. <laughs> thank you. And drinking so, water. Yeah, this, this would be good too. I, I think this would be very hard to deep fake, this kind of uh, effect. <laughs> Perfect. So I, I want to warn our audience uh, that we have booked you for an hour and a half. So we have about 35 minutes for questions. I'll be reading from the question and answer. Vito was very nice in filtering the questions. So if there are any questions that will not get answered, we'll make sure that we will make a document and reply to you. We don't want any questions unanswered here. So I'll start with my first question, um, honey. Are you creating deep fakes? <laughs> Yes, but only so that we can understand defense. Um, we do not publish any of the work that we do for the creation side. Um, anybody in cybersecurity knows that you have to have a red team and a blue team. You have to. Um, and so we do create deep fakes. We've created deep fakes of Zelensky. We don't have him saying anything outrageous. We're very careful about that. We don't release them. Um, but yeah, we you have to get good at this. Um, we also collaborate um, with other academics. We collaborate with companies. Um, some of them, I think, are better than others. Some of them are eager to collaborate with us because they know that their technology can be misused. Um, and you have to understand how these things are made if you're going to defend against them. So let me ask you, is defense, is deepfakes an element of offense or an element of defense? <laughs> A little bit of both I, I'm, and, and none. I mean, look, the Jennifer Lawrence, uh, Steve Buscemi deepfake is neither, it's just fun, right? I mean, lots of deepfakes. Understand something, by the way, the people who are developing this technology are not trying to destroy the world. Um, there are interesting applications of deepfakes uh, creatively in the art world, um, in the movie industry, clearly special effects. You can do amazing things with deepfakes. So most of the applications are neutral. Um, but of course, you know, technology will be weaponized. Um, I would say those creating the deepfakes are primarily on the offense side of things, and I'm on the defense side of things. But you can also imagine that creating deepfakes can be offensive, right? If you, for example, if, if a politician gets in trouble, um, legitimately saying something they never said, they can go on the offense by creating a bunch of deepfakes of themselves and carpet bombing the internet with it. Nobody knows what's what, right? So it goes both ways on that. And that, I think, is sort of an interesting aspect of these things. So we can talk more about it, but I want to start reading some of the questions, if you don't mind. Sure. So Sanyant asking, uh, what was the background of the participants for the synthesized faces experiment? Good. Uh, so these are mechanical Turkers, um, so uh, US-based only. Um, so they have no background as far as we know. Um, so they're just the average people. And that's not a bug. That's a feature. We wanted this to be the average person. We didn't want it with somebody who had expertise in computer graphics. Um, or computer vision or face perception, or was a super recognizer. We really wanted to know how the average person who sees a profile pic on LinkedIn, for example, or Twitter would respond to it. Um, I can tell you, by the way, that I'm pretty good at this and I did the task and I was only slightly better than 50%. So I don't think that there's anything about the background that's gonna help you. And what you saw is that even when we trained you, even when we gave you feedback, even when we gave you financial incentives, it didn't actually improve that much. I think there's probably some super recognizers out there. We know in the face literature, there are people who are very good at face recognition. I suspect there's gonna be a handful of people who are really good at this, but the average person looking at an average piece of content online, it's gonna be very, very hard. And it's going to get harder, by the way. We did those on StyleGAN2 images. StyleGAN3 has been released and StyleGAN4 is in the works. So it's only gonna get better and better. And you told us how to improve uh, StyleGAN4 already, correct? So Exactly. <laughs> so let's uh, have an observation from Alan it says, as a general observation, looks like the fake faces shy away from a toothy smile more than real. You don't have to answer yeah. this, but uh, people can see it as a comment. And also, there is I, I think that thing. may be true, actually. Um, teeth are very hard because there's this very discrete boundary between the teeth, and that has been historically bad. Um, I think StyleGAN 3 has gotten better at that. Um, so I, I think that may be an artifact of StyleGAN2 images that we used. Um, but it is true that there is, there is you know, we tend to be closer to the average faces. Um, there tends to be, I, I've already mentioned that the eyes are central. There does seem to be some patterns. Um, we, did, we did do, uh, we did count 
to see if there were differences in smiling and neutral and frowning. And we didn't see any significant differences. So that may have just been a bias of those eight images that I showed you. Um, but I think you're right. You don't see people doing that. But you don't see people doing that in real photos either when they're taking a profile pic. So it could just be that. So actually, Daniel has an interesting idea. Uh, what he asked is that can the information that you gave us for the soft behavior features yeah. Yeah. can be used for personal identity verification, lateral Good. innovation, correct? Thank you, Daniel. First of all, the, the short answer is yes. And the long answer is absolutely yes, because what we're really in the business of doing is not, in fact, detecting deep fakes. Uh, we're in the business of asking, is, the, is we're in the identity business, because whether it's a face swap deep fake or a lip sync deep fake or a puppet master deep fake, different ways of creating deep fakes or a diffusion based deep fake, or it's just an impersonator, right? There are people who impersonate other people. I don't care, right? I want it. This is an identity question. And what I like about framing it that way is that it survives the next generation and the next generation of deep fake. Whatever the new technologies are, I don't care. Underneath it, the core of what is wrong with a deep fake is that it's not you. And I really like that way of thinking about it. Um, and so I do think you're, you're absolutely right, is we think about this as an identity problem, not a deep fake. Deep fake is just one subset of the identity we want to verify. And allow me to put a, a, a plug for Tibayom, which was creatively name to include identity and behavioral sciences as the future mm -hmm. of biometrics. It's not only biometrics, correct? It's identity and behavioral sciences. Yeah. So Sania asks, will these biometric relevant videos also be weak to example President Biden speaking from home versus office? Good. Yeah, so this is what we call the context effect. Um, so you noticed in the Zelensky example, I showed you at a podium, I showed him at the press conference and behind his desk. Um, obviously, when you're sitting, you speak differently, right? When I'm standing, uh, first of all, I tend to sway a lot more. I tend to move. When I'm sitting, I'm constrained a little bit. Um, I don't have as much movement here. And so what we do is we train the system to learn these biometric, these identities across different settings. Now, obviously, how President Biden speaks when he's at his dinner table with his family, we're probably not going to get, but I don't, I don't care about that for the world leaders. I care about those settings when he is speaking, for example, on the way to Air Force One and somebody shoves a microphone in his face or an interview um, or at the, the, the press room in the White House. Um, with Zelensky, I didn't show it to you, but we've actually started adding in some of his selfies. He's actually taken to holding up the camera like this. That obviously changes a lot of things, right? First of all, he's closer to the camera. He can't move that arm. And so you do have to think about these different contexts and build that into the training. Again, with world leaders, it's a relatively small, finite set. In the general setting, probably going to be a lot harder. We're not going to get him at the dining room table. So actually, one of the anonymous attendees asked, behind, besides this detection forensic models being computationally expensive, GAN might soon be better at faking the facial, body, vocal, lighting. And you gave us some of those ideas. Yeah. So, so good. don't yeah. they represent a fundamental solution for fake rights? Okay. For fake so so this is so I'm glad somebody asked the question. Let's talk about that. So what what this is an arms race, you know, it's an adversarial system. Anybody in cybersecurity knows that. Here's what's working to our advantage, and then I'll tell you what's working to our disadvantage. What's working to our advantage, first of all, remember when I told you how the, the face scan the face swap works, one frame at a time. When you're synthesizing frame one, you don't know anything about frame uh, uh, 20 or 30 or 40. So we work on 10 second video clips with 300, 240 to 300 frames. So we have a huge advantage that we can see over time that the current synthesis engines cannot see. Um, eventually they will, but right now it's very expensive to synthesize and trying to synthesize temporally coherence is very difficult. That's number one. We have an advantage over time. Number two is that these synthesis engines are purely data driven. They actually don't, they, I told you, they don't know about axial symmetry. They don't know about eyebrows. They don't know about face movements. They don't know about eye blanks. They don't know about hands. They don't know about voice patterns. It's just pushing data around until it solves a biometric problem, which is, does this person's face look like that person's face? So we have an advantage that our representation is mid to high level that the current GANs don't know anything about. That's benefit number two. Benefit number three is the current GANs can't do hands. It's just a matter of time before they can, but I think we have a little bit of time here that the upper body is very difficult to do. Um, and in fact, if you look at the diffusion-based images of people, the hands are almost always really wonky. Hands are very, very difficult to synthesize. By the way, if you're an artist, they'll, they'll tell you the same thing. 
hands are very, very hard to draw because of how sophisticated and complicated they are. And by the way, faces are actually pretty low dimensional, right? The variation on human faces is pretty small, but look at how different my hand can be. Look at, look at what I can do with my hands. It's incredible. So capturing that space is incredibly difficult. And so that's another advantage. Here's the last one. We don't release our models. We publish the papers. We tell you what we're doing. We will share with other forensic researchers, but we don't publish the model. We don't make it freely available so as people can start to try to figure out how to reverse or even test their deep fakes. Now, is, there, is it an arms race? Sure. Will I lose? 100%. But along the way, what's going to happen is I'm going to take the ability to create a compelling deep fake of the President of the United States out of the hands of a teenager, and I'm going to put it in the hands of state-sponsored actors in Hollywood studios. Still a threat, but it's a more manageable threat. The real threat today is not you can create deep fakes. It's that anybody can create a deep fake. And that's a very different threat vector than a state-sponsored actor or a handful of Hollywood studios. The way I think about this problem right now is I need to remove that democratization. And I need to put the, the, the ability to create deep fakes to make it more expensive, more time consuming, riskier, and more difficult. And that starts to make the, the problem more manageable. I don't think it solves the problem, and I don't think anybody would ever say it does, but I think it makes it more manageable. Thank you, honey. So I, I think you told us that the problem of deep fake detection is a problem of identity science. But do you believe the approaches towards deep fake identification should be non-differentiable in order to prevent generative models from fine-tuning? Yeah. Um, when we develop forensic techniques, it's a great question. When we develop for forensic techniques, we are very keenly aware of the adversarial system. So we don't do things like, for example, take a frame of a video and build a machine learning classifier to tell if it's real or not. Because if you do that, then you just put that right into the discriminator. It's trivial, right? You're gonna you're gonna counter you're gonna you're gonna beat that system in a second. In fact, you're just gonna make the the, the discriminator even better. So we do tend to think about how do we bake in things like the temporal component? How do we bake in things like high level, uh, mid-level um, uh, representations, um, physics-based techniques, geometric techniques that current GAN systems don't know anything about? Now look, they may eventually know something about it, but currently they do not. And that is very much in our thinking is how difficult will it be for the adversary to defeat this? Um, very much from the very beginning of these techniques. So it's interesting that you mentioned that because there are two paths for combating video manipulation. Forensic videos to detect if the video is deep fake or not, or provide some providence to preserve the evidence of, of videos. So yeah. um, what are I your see, views? Good, uh, and I see my, my very good friend Ben Back has asked a question very similar to this. So um, everything I've been talking about is, if you will, after the fact. Video gets uploaded or gets submitted or journal or to, uh, to a journalist or to a social media or to whomever, law enforcement, so national security. And we have to ask, is it real or not? But there's another way to think about this problem, which is what if we could authenticate real videos? So debunking fake videos is good or verifying if they're real or not. But what if when I pick up this device to take a picture of something or a recording of something, what if the device itself could fingerprint and authenticate the provenance. So there's a, a really nice initiative that I'm involved in called the C2PA, the Coalition for Content Provenance and Authentication. It is a not-for-profit open source Linux foundation that is involves Microsoft and Adobe and the BBC and Sony and hundreds of other companies that are building a specification for doing control capture, provenance and authentication. The idea is that this thing, when you take a picture or recording, will grab uh, who you are, where you are, when you're there, we'll grab all of the pixels that you recorded, cryptographically sign everything, attach that to an immutable ledger and to the content. And then as that piece of content makes its way across the internet through it, through uh, an Adobe product for editing, which is fine, through a publisher and eventually on this piece of glass that I'm looking at, you will then be able to ask about the provenance um, and you'll be able to ask about the authentication and what has changed. We are keenly aware, let me just say right from the outset that um, tagging geolocation and date and time can be very risky for people who are documenting human rights violations. And so that provenance is it can actually be separated from the authentication. You can actually choose not to specify your location, date, and time, and identity, because for some people that is life-threatening. But if you choose to do it, you can actually have provenance and authentication. I really like this solution because the technology works. There's nothing sophisticated here. It's cryptographic um, 
hashes and uh, ledgers. Um, and it allows people who are taking things in war zones, documenting police um, um, violence, documenting human rights violations, documenting natural disasters, recording politicians speak to say, look, you don't have to trust me. You can trust the hardware. Um, and I really like that solution. And it's a really nice effort being um, um, pioneered by a number of the, uh, the technology giants um, to try to regain some trust from the other side, if you will. And I think we need both of those solutions. Excellent idea. And thank you for sharing this, because as, as Ben mentioned, we know that uh, newspapers uh, check the authenticity of what they publish, but not all the social media do that, correct? That, well, I would say none of the social media do that, but you're right. I mean, look, when the New York Times publishes a photo, um, first of all, many of these are taken from journalists that they know. And when it is social media, I can tell you, because I get the calls from the New York Times on a regular basis, they have questions about these photos. There is due diligence before they publish photos. You cannot say that about Mark Zuckerberg. Um, and so this way we can actually do crowdsourced um, documentation of anything going on in the world without having to worry about it, who is this person and why should I trust them? And I, I really like the solution. And, I, and I'm, I'm, the first specification, by the way, was released in January. 1.1 is coming out in the next few months. Um, I think this thing has real legs and I think it's going to really start to regain some trust in our, in our ability to trust what we see online in terms of multimedia. So, Honey, you told us this, this is an arms race, correct? That means that we are always falling behind. We are always trying to detect what the other yeah. guys are trying to do. Is this initiative the way to end the democratization of deep fakes? I, I think the C2PA is a way to sort of I, I would say partially break that cycle. Um, and because in some ways, what I like about it is it puts the burden not on you, the consumer, but on me, the producer, right? The burden should not be on every single one of us who, that navigates to a web page to be like, well, is this real or not? That's insane. It's a one to many publication. The burden should be on the one, not the many. And so I like this because I think it actually makes it, first of all, more, so first of all, people who are producing things can be trusted. And I think it starts to break that cycle. I think we will always need forensic techniques. Um, I mean, unless this thing is absolutely in every single hand and billions of devices in the world, we are still going to have to do forensics. So I think you have to think of, I think both of these are going to be part of the solution and there's probably gonna be other solutions as well. Um, but I do think that this really starts to break that cycle a little bit because it just addresses the problem in a fundamentally different way. Thank you, Hani. And to our participants, as you notice, I'm paraphrasing some of your questions, but if you're not happy with my paraphrasing, put your uh, question on the, on the board or email it to us and we'll ask Hani. So you saw us a lot of videos. What about the voice audios? Yeah. Are you working with just audio? Yeah, it's so the-, the, the, the audios. Yeah, so the, the Zelensky work, we do work with audio. Um, we have three parts to it, which is the, the facial, uh, gestural, the facial, gestural, and the voice. Um, we do pretty simple stuff on voice, never, nothing very complicated, simple spectrograms and um, uh, male spectrum uh, coefficients. Um, I think that right now we are focused on identity, not on synthesis, right? And that's a different problem. So I want to know, is this President Zelensky's voice? Um, I think there's another interesting problem, which is that, is this a synthetically generated voice, um, which is, goes beyond the identity? Um, I think, much to my surprise, there's much, much less work in that literature. You see a lot of work in the image and video, but there's less work in the audio space. And I think there's a lot to be done there. Um, I've seen a few papers out in the last few months, but it, I think there's a lot of work to be done because my guess is that these synthetically generated audios, as it is with the images and videos, are going to have some artifacts. Um, it's not physically being created. It's not going through a microphone. Um, it's, there's all kinds of things in there that are very difficult to hear. Um, and I think there's a lot of interesting work to be done in that space. So just, just to clarify, you show us the results where they are audio and you're analyzing both the images or the video and the audio, Correct. but you're not working on just audio. No, we are not. Yeah, we, we, what we have found, and I should have mentioned this in the ablation study. So when I showed you that ablation study and I showed you the accuracy as a function of number of features, what I should have mentioned is that no single category of features dominate. You need them all. So if we didn't have vocal, accuracy goes down. If we didn't have gestural, accuracy goes down. If we didn't have um, facial, accuracy goes down. You actually need the cross modality 
We need to know how does the head move as the voice changes. We need to know how the hand moves as the head moves. And so in fact, all of them are really important. And I think relying on only one of them, first of all, is unnecessary, but I don't think we'll get you where you need to get. So is the initiative that you mentioned uh, includes deepfake audios only? No, we, we create right. metadata just for deepfake audios. Right. So if, for example, somebody's on a phone call, um, we, we, have, we, are, we have nothing to say. Um, we are only working with video. We are assuming either this, like a Zoom call, um, or a YouTube video. Um, so we are not working with audio only. I think that's a really interesting question because some of the fraud that we have seen, I think the one that you and I both mentioned at the beginning on us, um, is was audio was purely audio based and that is a different problem uh, and that a really interesting one but not one that we are currently addressing. Yeah, just recording, correct? You don't even have to record phone calls. Sure. Just yeah. do a recording and you have this. Yeah, yeah like the Jerry Seinfeld one um, that you saw earlier. Yeah, we are we we have nothing to say about that. Um, I think we should, um, but we don't right now. I don't know if you want to give us an answer, but. How accurate are we now in detecting deep fakes, especially in the case of managing this information? You don't have to give us an answer. I'm just yeah, asking I, there, the there's, 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 there's a few parts to this answer. So first of all, is it depends. Um, if it's a full-blown video of President Zelensky, President Biden, and the handful of world leaders that we have, we're really good. Um, we're, it, it, you'll be hard to, to fool us. But that's, you know, I can count on, you know, two hands, the number of people we can protect right now. Eventually that may be in the few dozen, but that's gonna be that. So that, I think we'll be very, very good at that. But there's another part to this question that I think we should talk about, which is that if I create a video of say, uh, Elon Musk saying um, SpaceX's um, profits are down 20% and I have that go viral on Twitter, how long will it take for me to move the market to the tune of billions of dollars? I'll eventually figure out it's fake, but it won't matter. It won't matter, right? So there's another aspect to this, which is that once these things get online, first of all, they never go away. Um, and the impact can happen very quickly. Understand that that half-life of a social media post is measured in minutes. You can do a phenomenal amount of damage in a few minutes. A video of Biden saying, I've launched nuclear weapons against North Korea, Iran, Russia. How long does it take before somebody panics in the other part of the world and we're off to the races? There's a time component here. Even if we can figure out it's fake, we may still have trouble. Non-consensual sexual imagery. Actually, it's not that hard to find. You just look for people's face and they tell you I'm not in that image, but it won't matter, right? It's been carpet bombed on the internet. And so the detection is only part of the battle. You also have this problem that once content gets on the internet, horrific damage can be done to individuals' reputations and also to for purposes of fraud and to geopolitical implications. And so there's another aspect to this that I think detection is necessary, um, but it is not sufficient. So you talked about regulation. Regulation by whom? Regulation yeah. by government or, you know, yeah. we are in different governments. Uh, who, who is going to regulate this stuff if not the creators of the content? I got to say, this is a really great and hard question. So first of all, you know, you could say, well, this is a U.S. problem. The companies are here, but we're a country of 350 million people and there's 8 billion people in the world. And are we really comfortable regulating um, an entire sector um, for a significant number of the world that, isn't, that aren't represented here? I, I'm not. Um, we're starting to see regulation at the state level, for God's sakes. There are states in the United States that have, that have made non-consensual sexual imagery illegal at a state level, right? That's insane. I mean, I'm supportive of the legislation, don't get me wrong, but how do you enforce that at the state level on the internet, right? Should it be the EU? I mean, right now it is the EU. I mean, most of the regulation around privacy and online safety and security is coming out of the EU and Australia and a little bit out of the UK. Does that make sense? I mean, not really. Um, so I don't know. What I would like to see is that, I mean, really what you want, this is coming out of the UN in some ways, right? This should be all nation states should have a say in this. It is the internet and it doesn't know anything about borders, but I'm also not naive that I don't think that that's a trivial undertaking. What I would like to see at a minimum is at least the liberal democracies of the world unite and try to have a reasonably coherent approach to these issues. Um, so EU, uh, UK, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, America, the so-called five eyes. Yeah, that, 
probably we can agree. But then the world gets very complicated after that. What happened? What do you do in Brazil? What do you do in China? What do you do in Russia? Um, what do you do in other parts of the world that don't share the same core sociological um, and a political infrastructure that we have? I, I don't know, Giannis. Um, here's what I know, though, is sitting back and hoping that the tech sector is going to take care of itself is not working. We've tried that for 20 years. Um, we need to change the way we think. I would like to see just a little bit of modest regulation that says, you know, when your technology creates harm to individuals, societies, and democracies, you have some responsibility. The language coming out of the UK and the EU is a so-called duty of care. You are unleashing on the world a product. Just because it's digital doesn't mean that it's inherently safe or neutral. And you have a responsibility. You have a duty of care. And I like that language. And I'm hoping that, you know, from that, using that as a starting point, we can customize the regulation for each country accordingly. So if you were to speculate, why not even the five eyes have regulation about the duty of care? I have been trying um, to get the five eyes to agree. And even the five eyes can't agree, which tell you how difficult this is. All right? It tells you how hard this problem is. You know? so, so if we can dig down a little bit, it's not that they don't know that deep fakes cause harm, correct? They do know that. Yeah. So what's stopping I mean, simple, the government? Here, here's, sim here's simple things. Here in the US, we have a very, very strong First Amendment. We have a very strong culture of freedom of expression. That is unique to America, right? So you know, many of the people will say, well, look, we have a right to do things with deep fakes because it's a freedom of expression issue. I don't actually think it is, but other people disagree with me. But that sense of thinking is, doesn't pervade, doesn't, is not the same in Australia and in the UK. So just our ideals, our idea of how we balance personal expression, personal freedoms with societal good are quite different even within the five eyes, right? The companies are actually physically here. They are US-based companies for the most part, which means any regulation will have more of an impact on the economy of the United States than it will anywhere else. And so our, our interests are a little bit different than, for example, in Australia, which has been very, very good on these issues. They have a phenomenal e-safety commissioner, Julian Min Grant, who's been doing amazing work in trying to rein in the, the, the technology sector. Um, but again, you know, they're looking at it from a very different lens than the US is looking at it. So let me switch the subject a little bit. Uh, should you have a new curriculum on ethics on AI? Uh, absolutely. I think we should have several different things. I think, I think computer scientists, people like us, should think about these issues. Um, and I think they should also um, know something about history. Um, I think they should know something about politics. I think they should understand that this technology doesn't live in a vacuum. Um, this is not about, you know, us sitting in our basement and, you know, screwing around with a couple of our friends. The things we do now are everywhere. Here's a good example of that, since we're at a biometric um, council, face recognition. When we started working on face recognition, what, 30 years ago, nobody thought that this was going to be used to commit horrific human rights violations around the world. We didn't, we didn't think about it. We didn't have the scaffolding to think about it. We need scaffolding. Um, and I think that that could be really valuable. You see this, by the way, you know, medicine, biology. We think about ethics in there because there's complicated issues of, of that, that intersect religion and, and philosophy and ethics and, and the science. I think we have to start thinking about that. I would like to see it. Um, I've been advocating this for a while. The problem is nobody knows how to teach it. <laughs> None of us are trained. <laughs> it's really hard. <laughs> um, but that's I think that's true. not a good excuse. But uh, this is why we have the IEEE Biometrics Council, and maybe they should put a tax force. I'd say, I, I, hope I would love to see us think through what, what should this look like, and, that, and, and how would you mandate this for all computer science majors? And can I just add one more thing here? There is a lot of talk these days about um, underrepresented groups in, in, in the technology sector, women, people of color. And that is 100% true. And, and it's frankly not getting any better despite talking about it a lot. This is a really good example of one of the implications or the consequences of underrepresentation of, for example, women. That people who are developing these technologies ahead aren't thinking, well, somebody's going to use this to create non consensual sexual imagery, which by far impacts women, because women aren't in the room. Right? The, the, the point of, of equal representation is that people who are impacted by these technologies, primarily people of color, people in the LGBTQ community, women have to be in the room and having these conversations with us, not just people who look like the three of us. 
And there's yet another reason why I think equal representation across the board is so incredibly important in our field. So I know you have mentioned that, but I'll ask you to repeat it for all our participants. This is not the first time we have misinformation in the internet, correct? But What's different this time? Yeah, yeah. First of all, we've had misinformation for as long as we've had information. It's, it predates the internet by hundreds of years. Let, let's admit that. But there's a couple of things that are different. First of all, social media has completely obliterated any barrier to publication. That is good in many ways, right? That was the promise of the internet for us, democratize access to knowledge and information. Everybody can be a publisher. And there was a, an ideal there, but also that meant that bad people <laughs> can now have no barriers to entry. So we have completely obliterated barriers to entry for people to reach billions, millions of people around the world. That's number one in the misinformation front. Number two is, the deep fake stuff that we have been talking about, the ability to create highly compelling, sophisticated images and videos of people saying things that they never did. That's number two. Here's number three, which is the big one, which is not only can you create this stuff and not only can you put it online, but social media favors the hateful, outrageous, salacious, conspiratorial content over decent, honest, and informative because it drives engagement. Social media today is in the ad-driven, engagement-driven, outrage-driving business. And so not only can you create it, not only can you publish it, social media favors that over the trusted, right? Brandeis had this great line, the best response to false information is more information, not less. He's right, don't ban speech, but that only works when you have a fair marketplace of ideas. It only works when good, decent ideas can compete equally with the bad indecent, but they don't. These things are favored because that drives engagement, which means the algorithms that are curating your Facebook feed and your Instagram feed and your TikTok feed and your YouTube feed are favoring the problematic content over the non-problematic. And that, those three things are what are very different today than even just 20 years ago, let alone hundred years ago. Um, and that's what worries me. So thank you, Hani. Uh, and you told us all the dangers of deep fakes. Is there anything good about deep fakes? <laughs> sure. Look, if you haven't seen it, go to YouTube and search for Nick Cage in the Sound of Music. It's fantastic. People are splicing Nick Cage into movies, and it's hysterical. He's twirling on the mountaintop singing, and it's brilliant. Um, there are really entertaining applications. Um, I think for political satire, it's fantastic. I think we should make deep fakes of the, the queen. Um, I think we should use these as a, as a means for political discourse. Um, in the special effects industry, we are seeing them being used in movies for special effects, to make people look younger, to splice in new people, um, different actors, actresses. I, I think that's really cool. Um, here's my favorite application, which is, um, I just watched a, a documentary that was um, dubbed from the original German into English, and it's incredibly annoying. But we can now create lip sync deep fakes, where we take a new audio track and we resynthesize the mouth to be consistent so that it doesn't look like it's dubbed. That's amazing, right? What if, for example, when I'm talking now, and there are people in other parts of the world who don't speak English, I would be simultaneously translated into French, Italian, Chinese, Spanish, and then my mouth would be synthesized so that it was as if I was speaking those languages. Amazing. That, that's an incredible application. So lots of really interesting applications, no doubt about it, but also problematic ones. And now our job is to figure out how do we balance these two? Is the good outbalancing the bad? I don't know. Um, I think it still remains to be seen. So we have many students in the webinar today. They are looking for the next hot topic to work on. So how does the future look for deep fakes? I mean, if you were 20 years younger. <laughs> if only if only we were, Giannis, back in the grasp lab um, in that corner office. I remember we were all the way in the back in the corner over there. Here's the thing that has really surprised me about deep fakes. I've been doing this for a long time and I got pretty good at predicting where things were going because the, the cadence was, you know, you could measure in years. Now the cadence is weeks and months. Um, I mean, the diffusion based stuff. I mean, we were just starting to get our heads around the GAN generated faces and deep fakes and suddenly we got diffusion based. 
right? I'm like, whoa, where'd that come from, right? <laughs> much more sophisticated, much more powerful. We are just starting to think about how do we detect these images and meta announces now we can do video. It is a fast moving space. Um, so I don't think, I think it's very hard to predict where it's going. I, it's full stop. I think it's just hard to predict. But here's what I will, I'm comfortable predicting is that it's not going to stop. Um, the era of synthetic media is here. Um, there are going to be misuses of it. Um, they are going to span cybersecurity, um, non-consensual sexual imagery, disinformation campaigns, fraud, all kinds of things. And I think there's going to be a phenomenal amount of work to be done on the forensic side. I mentioned earlier how outgunned our community is. Way more people go to computer vision, computer graphics, and machine learning that come to the side. I'd like to change that balance a little bit. I think there's really interesting problems to be um, done on the side. And by the way, we use all the same tools and then some. Um, and I think uh, if, if for the students um, in the audience, there is a phenomenal amount of research. Um, you mentioned one of them, which is what happens with just pure audio. Um, I see my friend Haf Hafiz Malik here. Um, he's actually done some really nice work in audio detection. So if you haven't seen his work, you should go look at his work at um, um, that. I think he put a link there. Um, yeah. Thank you, Hafiz. He put a link there uh, for some of the audio detection. He's actually one of the few people I can think of um, that is actually doing some audio. I think there's a lot of work to be done in audio uh, detection, um, as well as image and video and the new diffusion based and six months from now, whatever else is coming down the road. So 30 seconds, because we have to bid you a farewell. What's your opinion for the AI Bill of Rights that was recently released by the White House in US? It's fine. You don't have to have an opinion if you want. No, to it's 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 fine. I I think it's it's um it's not as detailed and a little bit too vague for my taste. But I'm glad we're having the conversation. Um, I'm ab absolutely supportive of it. Um, I see one question from Charles about what about extending IRB to computer science. I think that's a great question. IRB stands for Institutional Review Board. Um, when we do, for example, the human studies that I referred to earlier, we have to get IRB approval before we interact with humans. I like that idea of, should I create this technology? Maybe we should have somebody who is helping us think through some of the issues. I think that's a great idea, Charles. And if I want to add my two cents, I think the approval of the IRB board should be added to the papers, but that's a different question. I agree. And by the way, one of the things we are starting to see in the review process is what are the ethical implications of this technology? And I'm very supportive of that, both in the review process and in the publication process to at least force the authors even if they're not going to address it, you should at least be forced to think about it. Excellent. So uh, on behalf of the Biometric Council, I want to thank all our participants. I want to thank you, Hani, for the enticing presentation and the discussion we had afterwards.